All right. I think we're I think we're about ready to start it. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm Anders, uh, and I work for Styra, the founders of the Open Policy Agent Project, or OPA. And I'm Will Beeson. Uh, I work on Gatekeeper full time for Google. All right. So the agenda for today is uh, an introduction for to the OPA project. I don't know how many of, of you are using OPA already. It's a lot of hands, but it, some some hands missing as well. So you might appreciate that. Uh, followed by a, some project updates for, for those of you who are using Alpha. And then we'll, we'll uh, guide you through uh, Gatekeeper and some project updates there. So uh, starting with OPA, like uh, what is the challenge or what's the problem we're trying to solve with OPA? It's basically this, it's to manage policy in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. So a modern application stack and consists of a, a wide array of, of programming languages and platforms, frameworks, and so on. And obviously, uh, an ap application needs to be deployed somewhere. And, and on top of that, you have infrastructure and you got data. So the goal of the OPA project is really to try and unify policy across this whole cloud native stack. So that's basically what, what OPA does. It's, it's, it's a policy engine to unify policy across the whole stack. So uh, first question to answer might then be what is a policy? So a policy, it's basically a set of rules uh, governing perhaps what you can and can't do. So rules can of course be anything like organizational uh, rules or policy might be things like app authorization, determining who is allowed to do something or, or not based on some uh, conditions. Kubernetes admission control, of course, is a popular use case. Uh, we see policies from infrastructure, build and deployment, pipelines, data filtering, much more. So uh, a benefit we get from, from kind of breaking out our policies from PDF files or Word documents and kind of bringing that into uh, the domain of code is that we may treat policy as any other way, uh, as any other code. So all the benefits are provided by code. So things like peer review, testing, analysis, linters, and so on. So we can start to reason about policy as any other code, kind of make, making that accessible to developers. And the key concept of policy as code is, is this idea of decoupling. So sort of that like how you decouple storage from an application by moving that into the database. We believe that uh, policy deserves the same kind of decoupling. And uh, aside from the benefits already mentioned that you can kind of reason about policy uh, in its own, it's also that uh, the life cycle of policy can be treated independently from the life cycle of your application. So you can make policy changes to your application without having to redeploy or having to recompile. So that's policy. And OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. And a policy engine works that you kind of ask it based on the policy you have uh, loaded into OPA, you ask it a question and you get back a response or a decision. As of last year, I graduated CNCF project. So OPA offers a unified tool set and a framework for working with policy across the whole stack. So across all these, this wide set of technologies and frameworks. And OPA builds on this idea that you decouple policy from, from your application or your business logic. We separate policy decisions from enforcement, meaning OPA makes decisions, it doesn't enforce those decisions. So if OPA says, no, this person should not be allowed uh, to view uh, this journal or this endpoint. It's still up to the application to enforce that decision. So that's a, an important distinction. Policies written in a declarative language called Rego. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. We'll, we'll take a look at that in a bit. But first, uh, some numbers from the community. So Open now has over 250 contributors, 70 listed integrations in the uh, ecosystem page. So there's a, a big, 
uh, ecosystem of tools, integrations, frameworks, all using Opa. 800 projects listed on GitHub as using Opa, 6,600 GitHub stars, 5,800 Slack users, and over 130 million downloads. Uh, so the ecosystem is not just OPA, but it's, there's a lot of tool, tooling built around OPA, uh, even in, within the OPA project. One such tool is ConfTest, to allow you to uh, write policy and, and run that policy on files, local files on your system. So it's, it's uh, commonly used for like CI, CD pipelines. There's uh, obviously also the, the gate, OPA Gatekeeper, which we'll, we'll be talking about later. And there's some editor integrations like VS Code and IntelliJ. So kind of a good quote here, summarize what OPA is really about. Uh, so the Open Policy Agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that's basically what OPA is. So how does it work then? There's, I think there's basically two uh, concepts or two key things that makes OPA work with all these uh, technologies. And it's the policy decision model and it's Rego. So the policy decision model, it, it, it's a very simple one. It basically uh, works like this. You have a service, a service that serves requests. So there's requ requests coming into the service and uh, rather than making a policy decision itself, it forwards that request over to OPA. And that query is just a, a REST call and the input is just any JSON and OPA based on the policy and data it has available, makes a decision and returns that to the service. And that response is also just JSON. So pretty much anything that can talk HTTP and understands JSON can integrate with OPA. And when we say service, it's not necessarily like a microservice. It could be anything. It could be a, a Kafka broker, uh, a Linux PAM module, an API gateway or whatnot. And of course, like all, most of these technologies have some way of communicating over HTTP. So Rego then, that's the other kind of pillar of, of OPA. It's a declarative high level uh, policy language. So not really a general purpose language, but it's surprisingly versatile. It allows you to write uh, policy across this whole cloud native stack. And a policy, just like a real world policy, it's just a, bit, it's just a number of rules. And these rules, when you query them, they return a decision. And that decision is commonly true or false. Are you allowed or not? But it's certainly not limited to that. But a decision can be anything that would be valid JSON. So strings, lists, objects, and so on. Pretty common thing to do is to return a reason, for example, if you, if you deny someone, you might want to tell them why so that they can do something about it. Uh, OPA ships with a, a unit test framework, which is really useful as well. So you can you know, test your policies in isolation, you can build trust in those before you deploy them out in your applications. It's a well-documented project. And there's the Rego playground if you want to try things out on your own. So crash course in Rego here teaching yourself Rego in one minute. So uh, on the top, we have a policy. We have one rule here. Uh, and you can think of a rule, uh, a bit like a, an inverted if then statement. But we'd rather say then if. So we kind of flip that around and we say, allow is equal to true if all the conditions here in the body are equal to true. So in, th in this case, we'd say, allow will evaluate to true if the input request method is get and the path, the first path component is users, and the next path component is equal to the username provided in the, in the query or in the input. So if you were to write this in JavaScript or some imperative language, you'd see that it gets quite clunky to kind of repeat assertions in the if, uh, in if statements, and it doesn't compose very well. So that was an introduction to OPA and an introduction to Rego. So uh, now for, for those of you who are familiar with, with OPA, some project updates. Uh, so there's a, a couple of new keywords 
if, uh, if you haven't tried them out already, I can highly encourage you to do so. There's a new keyword called in, which uh, does pretty much what it sounds uh, like it would do. It checks for membership. So you can say, is this value in this collection? Similar to what you could find in, in Python, for example. So the way you do this previously would be to iterate over a collection and then check if there any value equal to this. Now you can rather say something like, is admin in uh, the group of the groups for this user? Or is the input request not in head or the get set? Uh, there's a sum in keywords, which is a new way to do iteration, which, kind of, uh, which uh, I think might feel more familiar to users coming from other languages. And finally, there's the every keyword, which is a new way of expressing for all, which is kind of very useful if you want to, if you want to express conditions like you want to require all, all containers in this uh, deployment must come from the internal company registry and things like that. This was previously a bit clunky to do. A common way of doing it would be to iterate over all the containers, check for that specific value, and then compare that to the total count of the containers. And now you can just say every container in containers starts with my internal company registry, and that's either gonna be true or not. Some notable features uh, recently released. First one is Delta bundles, which allows uh, bundles of data to uh, or it, it allows OPA to fetch only the deltas. So if, there's, if you have a large uh, set of data and you make an update to that, OPA can fetch only what was actually changed and not the whole bundle, which was previously the case. There's a new strict, strict mode, which allows you to catch like common errors, unused variables, uh, unused imports, things like that. So it's not, not all the way to a linter yet, but it's, it's, it's a good step on the way. So check that out if you're, if you're uh, working with OPA. Other metadata annotations, which allows you to, and as can you see on the, on, on the picture there, which allows you to annotate your rules, your packages, and so on. And this, these annotations can then be fetched by other tools. So you can generate documentation, or you can even use uh, the annotations uh, from inside of your rules or things like severity levels and so on. Uh, there's no new uh, OCI bundle registry support, meaning you can package uh, your policy and data, push that to a, a registry and have OPA fetch that. Disk storage is another nice feature if you have a lot of uh, policy or data and, you, and it's more than what can normally fit in memory. Now you can also choose to have that uh, stored on disk. Finally, there's function mocking added to uh, the OPA test framework. So, uh, okay, so some planned improvements or some things on the, on the roadmap, which I think we'll see in the, uh, soon. So there's uh, work in progress on, on some built-in functions for working with GraphQL. There's been a lot of uh, demand for that. Uh, named built-in function arguments. So all the built-in functions, uh, We'll now have like names by default, which can be used by editors, things like that. So we can provide better documentation in line. So you don't need to kind of hop back and forth between your editor and, and the open docs. Dependency management, that's been very frequently uh, requested. That's coming. We'll see, uh, it remains to be seen like in what form and so on. But so you can basically say that this policy depends on uh, this other policy somewhere else on the net. And test result diffs, so you can say uh, this test, not just that this uh, test failed, but what, what was the diff or why did it fail? Uh, there is an optimization flag uh, already available for OPA build. We plan to extend that to, to other commands as well. And finally, we want to include non-deterministic values. Uh, there's a few, of, few functions in, in Rego, like the HTTP send one. Uh, which you obviously you can't kind of you can't expect to send the same call two months later and expect the same result because whatever is on the other uh, end might have changed. 
So we kind of want to save uh, the result of making those calls as, along with the decisions. So two months later, you can uh, go back to your policy and you can replay that decision exactly as it was at the time. Finally, some uh, updates from the ecosystem. Again, OPA is much more than just OPA, the core project. Uh, there's a new uh, hook, uh, OPA-based, for AWS CloudFormation. It allows you to do much of the same things uh, that you've been able to do with OPA for Terraform in the past, you can now do for AWS CloudFormation as well. There's a new setup OPA GitHub Actions, so you can easily pull in OPA in your GitHub Actions workflow and have OPA run tests or, or whatnot. Sans, Sans Shell is an interesting project. It's a non-interactive daemon for host management. You can basically, uh, you can have policies decide what should be allowed uh, on a host or not. So maybe you want to read a file or write something to, to so it's, be, it's pretty much like an SSH client, but policy powered. Uh, Reposour, another cool project, which allows you to, to, to specify policy on your GitHub organization. You might say like things like any pull request must have at least two, uh, two reviewers, and then you can scan your whole organization for any violations uh, uh, over those policies. And lastly, there's the OPA Cuddle, it's, which was, I think that was published like yesterday or something, so very new. But it, it allows you to turn any Rego policy into a CLI command, so you can pipe the output of uh, things like ls into that and have policy determine uh, what to return. So you might want to use that for data filtering or whatnot. So that's some updates from OPA. I'm handing over to Will for uh, the gatekeeper part. All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, two layers that are built on top of OPA, which uh, there's uh, what we call frameworks, which is just a repository that several projects actually depend on, and then gatekeeper, which is built on top of frameworks. So uh, the idea of frameworks is representing policies as KRM objects, so you have, uh, you have types that, uh, so an individual policy that is Rego code, that gets instantiated as a CRD in Kubernetes, and then you can apply constraints, which are also KRM objects. So you have these objects in your cluster, and then whatever applications you have can evaluate those uh, in real time, and you can, you can add and remove constraints, you can add and remove uh, templates uh, to configure policies on the fly. Uh, Gatekeeper is written specifically as a way of both uh, uh, an admission controller, which, which determines whether or not objects pass all of the OPA policies that are configured on the cluster, and then additionally, you can configure it as an audit hook, which uh, periodically monitors all resources on the cluster so that you can be sure that everything is uh, compliant with the policies that you have. Uh, and then I have uh, the main things I'm going to cover are with it for frameworks. Uh, we have a ton of performance improvements the past year, and then we have interface changes. So any projects that are dependent on frameworks, there's gonna be uh, some pain points around that the interface has changed and that kind of sucks but uh, we think the performance improvements are worth it. As far as Gatekeeper, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, implemented external, the external data feature. We have the new Gator CLI, which is built to be similar to ConfTest, but for, uh, uh, specifically for uh, Gatekeeper constraint templates and constraints. And then uh, there's a few other changes I'm gonna go over. Uh, so first off, uh, changes to frameworks. Uh, so the, what you see here is a, it's a memory graph of uh, launching Gatekeeper, obviously built on top of frameworks, with 100 constraint templates and 1,000 constraints, and this is memory usage over time. Uh, the darker blue is from uh, several months ago, and then the very flat uh, lighter blue line is uh, just from a couple weeks ago. So as you can see, uh, memory usage is way down, it's much more stable, if you note all of the spikes in the and uh, a few weeks ago, that's because the Go garbage collector is being called a lot more, uh, whereas now memory usage is much more stable. So uh, the big thing here was uh, when, or one of the big things was uh, 
what it used to be was that when, uh, if you booted up a cluster and you applied 100 constraint templates, uh, we had a quadratic load time problem. Uh, the, uh, the difficulty was that because we, pump, we put everything in a single OPA compiler runtime environment, uh, we had to recompile that every time we added or removed one, and since a compilation environment is one unit that you can't add or remove things from, uh, recreating this every time a template was added or removed was just awful to have it start up. So uh, this means that you get a, a 3x to 20x speed up in template compilation, uh, and uh, the time that you spend waiting for a template to compile is uh, just the time for that template, not for all templates that you've had before. Uh, there's also a 2x speed up in adding uh, constraints for these templates. And then uh, because we, we, rewrote, we rewrote how uh, how queries to the, the OPA compilation, the compiled uh, Rego are run, so they're actually two to three times faster. And uh, we actually achieved 100x speed up in running the match criteria. So this is where uh, in gatekeeper constraints, uh, which specify uh, which specify uh, constants for Rego policies. Uh, you can specify match criteria which say these policies only apply to uh, these specific versions, these specific kinds, or uh, objects with these specific labels or annotations. Uh, though do note that these numbers are very use case dependent, so uh, if you're able to move your match criteria to uh, the constraint itself rather than the Rego, uh, then you'll get a lot more of a speed up than uh, if you have more specialized use cases and aren't able to do that. Uh, and then additionally, for audit itself, we actually achieved a 20x reduction in uh, memory usage. Uh, uh, this was, uh, this is using a similar, using a, a similar set of uh, setup as for the previous slide. And uh, so again, 100 templates, 1,000 constraints, and then a bunch of namespaces config maps. Uh, so it should be much easier to add, uh, to enable auditing for your, re your resources on your clusters. Then uh, behavioral changes, so um, finally updated OPA. We're now on, uh, we're, we're now on uh, version 39, I believe the pull request for version 40 is out. So we get all of the future keywords and uh, we will soon have the other features that Anders talked about. Um, uh, Client driver, those interfaces were reworked. Um, uh, definitely go visit the repository if you have a project which uh, depends on that because uh, there have been significant changes. We hope that the changes are, uh, are, more, are more in line with how you would reason about uh, building these kinds of systems. And then uh, gatekeeper changes. So uh, first off, uh, the new feature, one of the new features we have is external data. This lets you communicate with external systems. So it's more secure than HTTP.send. It's also uh, much more constrained. So whereas HTTP.send lets you, I mean, just send arbitrary HTTP requests, uh, external data treats uh, the whatever external uh, data provider that you're communicating with as a key value store. So it's able to batch requests, you get improved cache hits. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, when writing these uh, data providers, uh, uh, you're able to configure a lot, uh, a lot of things yourself. So you can do things like, how long do I keep caches? Uh, uh, you can tune it to your specific use case. Uh, example use cases for the external data feature are things like LDAP. Uh, you can actually integrate with LDAP now. Uh, you can limit things like who can change what fields on specific Kubernetes resources. You can even auto label resources with team metadata using uh, the uh, mutation feature. You can also do things like you could connect with uh, a CVE vulnerability system to check to see if uh, images have uh, specific vulnerabilities that you absolutely don't want to have on your cluster. Uh, for mutation, external data is a bit constrained. Uh, evaluation is synchronous, uh, uh, and uh, because you're very latency constrained when you're modifying resources, because you don't want to do things like uh, uh, kill a leader elections, so you can only use string value data for this. Uh, then there's the Gator CLI, which I mentioned before. Uh, we've built this to be uh, similar, it's to feel very similar to ConfTest, so uh, you have Gator Verify, which is like ConfTest Verify, and this is unit tests for templates and constraints. So 
you'll say, I have this template, uh, it specifies these variables, like you, you have a template that might say, uh, I require this, I require some annotation to be set to some value, and then you have a constraint that says what, uh, what annotations and values you want, and then the test will say, okay, um, uh, th these, these objects should be let through, and these objects should be rejected and not let through. Uh, Gator, Gator test, however, is similar to comp test test, so this is where if you have an entire repository of YAML, and you just want to be sure that everything that you're going to apply to your cluster does actually conform to all of the policies that you have, Gator test just lets you uh, uh, see all of your current violations all at once. Uh, this, is the, this is sample output from running Gator Verify. So uh, if you're familiar with GoTest, the output is designed to be very similar to this. So you have uh, individual test suites, and then uh, you can see failure messages. So in this case, uh, we, got, uh, we got a violation where we didn't expect one in unit tests, and the other, uh, we got two violations on a resource when we expected three. So uh, in this case, obviously, we'd have to go back and change either the constraints or the templates themselves. Uh, you can also validate that specific messages are sent uh, by the uh, by the Rego policies. So if you want to make sure that the message that you want to show up to whatever developer tried to apply a resource is actually sent to the developer that they see that because you don't want it's it's awful it's an awful experience if you just get oh this this resource isn't allowed to be applied but you have no message. Um, other improvements are. Uh, uh, we have Prometheus metrics for conflicting mutators. So if you have a uh, mutation, which is one of the gatekeeper features that lets you uh, modify resources as they're incoming to the cluster, uh, sometimes these can be configured in ways where uh, we, can't, we can't necessarily catch this, this problem as you're applying the uh, mutation objects. So uh, you can now have a Prometheus metric for detecting when this happens. It's, uh, it's kind of infeasible at an organizational level when you have dozens of people all adding these mutators that they're, they're never going to conflict. And then also for, help for the Helm charts, you can now configure to remove the webhooks before uninstalling Gatekeeper. Uh, so don't take out your cluster while uninstalling. Uh, before what happened was, uh, if you just did kubectl delete everything, if you delete the pod first and you have Gatekeeper configured in a fail closed mode, you can no longer modify anything on your cluster because Kubernetes tries to call the webhook because you tried to apply or delete something, uh, the webhook wasn't available, and so you just bricked your cluster. So uh, please do remember to uh, configure uh, webhooks to be removed first before uninstalling Gatekeeper with Helm. Yep, and thank you. All right. Uh, is there any questions or? Yeah. Oh. yeah. No questions. Okay. I'll yeah. be uh, in the Styra booth later. If anyone has, oh, there's a question over there. There's another question over there. Oh. Uh, how do you improve your um, the, um, the gatekeeper uh, two or three times faster? How do you do that? Oh, um, uh, if you want to talk, to, oh, yeah. If you want to talk to me after, um, I am happy to go into great detail on how we achieved the speed ups. Uh, it's just, it's just extremely technical, and uh, my initial report on this was literally twenty pages long. But I would love to talk about it. Right. There's another. Hi. Thank you so much for a great presentation. So. I was uh, wondering about um, the cadence for Gatekeeper uh, how, uh, and the release cadence compared to the normal OPA project. How often uh, are you supposed to upgrade the OPA binaries or uh, OPA library? Uh, we've been trying to, st so uh, the question was, uh, what's the release cadence for Gatekeeper? How often should you expect to upgrade the binaries? Uh, we do a, uh, we do, a, so um, uh, we're on 3.7 or 8 now, uh, so the, the minor version upgrades approximately every three months, and then the patch version, usually it's every one month. Uh, 
really it's best to uh, not fall behind, uh, say, six months. Uh, but uh, I don't recall off the top of my head what our, uh, like, what our support window is, though. Yeah. Hi. I wonder um, how much usage do you see in uh, Istio's in Istio service mesh? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that? Yes, I was wondering uh, how much usage of OPA do you see in Istio service mesh? Istio. I Istio? Um, or oh, of what, what about, what yeah, about Istio? Do you see that there is a lot of uh, users uh, using the, the OPA plugin in Istio? Oh, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do not know. Oh, is, is that, that might be more for me, or are you talking about the Envoy plugin or Envoy Istio plugin for? Um, about the Envoy I did, plugin, I didn't know. I know about the Istio plugin. Yeah. So there's an uh, yeah. It, it was it was called Istio, the Istio plugin previously. I think it, it was renamed like a, a year ago or so. So it's not called the Envoy plugin, but it's it works for for both Envoy and Istio. And yeah, for sure, it, I think it's one of the more uh, it's one of the more common ways to to call out OPA for any kind of any any cluster where you have have that service service mesh. So definitely a very popular project. Okay. Used by many large corporations or organizations. All right, there was another question. And one uh, one down there as well a, later. A short question to Anders. Uh, how many how much load can OPA handle? Like, what are the big use cases you've seen? Like, how many requests per second can we expect OPA to handle? Oh, yeah, I, I think questions like that are, they are always very difficult to answer, like, because it all depends on, like, uh, how much policy, like, what does your policy look like? What does your policy do? And, and not to mention, like, resource allocations and how much do you have, but in, in general, I think, like, uh, OPA, your application is going to go down before OPA. Uh, yeah, if you if you come to me after the talk, I do have specific numbers for gatekeep for uh, or for frameworks actually, so I might be able to get you specific numbers on that. So I have uh, I have several uh, different policies that I configure to varying complexities. Uh, there's another question down there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the Rego uh, language. What, what was the need for this language? Because uh, I saw that uh, you are implementing a lot of features that already exist in other languages. So for comparison, for lists, for dependency management. So, so, so what was the question was, what, what was the kind of reasoning behind Rego yes. or so? And why not, for example, Python, JavaScript, or Lua, or yeah, something like that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a, it's a pretty common question. People are like, can I not just use JavaScript or whatever? Uh, and I think like there are certain characteristics to Rego uh, that we what, that we want for policy. Like, first of all, what you want to do with a policy is basically adding a safety net. It's a guardrail around like whether it's for authorization, whether it's for admission control or whatnot. So a very really important like characteristic is of course that uh, that policy does not like turn around on you and and fails or that it can't terminate for example. So if you would have a language where you can uh, do things like uh, end up in a in a never ending loop and you can't guarantee that this uh, this will ever never terminate. So things like that. It's basically like kind of the premise of a Rego where you have certain guarantees on like things like uh, process consumption, that the policy evaluation terminates and so on. Uh, and as for the design, like Rego is, uh, has its root in, in kind of logic programming and data log. So yeah, it, it does look uh, fairly different if you come from like an imperative language, uh, which I think many of, of, of us do. It's uh, spending some time to learn kind of the principles is uh, I, f I find very enlightening. It, it kind of makes you, it makes you reason about uh, any code in a different way. So there's, there's definitely a learning curve. But once you get past it, it's like, it's a great place to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there's, oh, there's, sorry. 
Yeah, so my question's um, regarding, so if you look at o OPA, it seems like it's meant for um, server back, you know, like back-end type of um, applications. But what about like user experience? You know, do you see anyone, like can, can OPA be leveraged to um, enforce like some of these policies at the front end user experience layer? Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think like, yeah, to some degree, for sure. Uh, pretty common thing to do is like to have, uh, you do the enforcement in the back end, but you kind of propagate that in some nice way up, uh, up to the front end. Uh, there is also a few projects that have, uh, that are working on like not even, perhaps not even sending the request to the back end in the first place, but rather kind of uh, evaluate the policy in the front end and show the result without even propagating. You, you'd obviously want that control still in the back end, but uh, for performance reasons, or maybe you, maybe you want to show a view that only lists items that you have access to and so on. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, you can either, you can compile uh, your Rego policies to WebAssembly uh, and run those in the browser. Uh, there's, and there's a few other projects to, to try and make that possible and, and easier. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting uh, topic. I think there's uh, a, a lot of potential there. So, I mean, would you say it's advisable or could you, would it make sense to say like, you know, you deploy OPA and all that, but then you tell like some other uh, uh, stakeholders to write policies? Do you think they are, you know, easy enough to learn like, or what's your experience on there and, and or if that makes any sense or? Uh, so it around around learning Rego? Or yeah, so I, again, I think there's definitely a, there's definitely a learning curve, and uh, yeah, so but learning the basics uh, is not I don't find that very uh, difficult. And then there's a lot of details, of course. But if you want to just do something simple like the allow rule we showed before, I think that's like after a couple of hours, you feel pretty confident with like the basics of the language. But then. Uh, you definitely need more time for uh, to learn like all the details, but uh, but of course uh, I think like having if if you're a development team or whatnot, I don't think that perhaps not everyone needs to know like uh, not everyone needs to be an, a Rego expert, but kind of mastering the basics that's that's a good good start, and I think that does not require uh, that much of an investment. Yeah, there was a, oh, there's two more. Are we, are we good on time or, yeah? There was one here. Great talk, many thanks. Uh, one question, um, actually two. Uh, can OPA coexist with PSP? And um, how is the migration in that direction? Um, First question. The second one: um, Do you have some some resources or um, GitHub source uh, with best practices of oh. um, what to or how to use uh, the language? Right. Oh yeah. Can I take Thanks. this one? For sure. Oh yeah. So uh, OPA and PSP can absolutely coexist. Uh, uh, as part of Gatekeeper, we wrote something called the Gatekeeper Library, which is a companion repository. And what the Gatekeeper Library repository has is uh, dozens and dozens, I think it's about 70, uh, 70 policies uh, in Rego implemented as constraint templates. So you actually see the, the full Rego code. Uh, and I think around 20 or so of those are specifically for uh, PSP. So uh, we, uh, so you, you, so PSP and uh, OPA can absolutely exist, uh, and uh, like I know several people that are doing exactly that. Yeah, and as for the second question there, we are just like a, a, a style guide, or uh, there's not been one, uh, but I've actually been working on that for the last week, and uh, I'm hoping to make that public this week. So. Last question, I think, down there.
This one's more of an adoption question. Like, how do you, um, you know, typically, like you have in, in large enterprise, you have maybe a common set of policies that everyone needs to use, and then application teams may have specific policies. So what do you see in the enterprise from an adoption perspective? Like, how do you, you know, how do you know what policy is out there? Um, enforcement that's happening, alerts, anything you can share on that space? Yeah, sure. So like, so the question is, like, how do you manage OPA at scale, basically? And how do you, how do you provision policies to like thousands of, of, of uh, decision points? I think like OPA allows for, via uh, management APIs, you have like the bundle API, you have the decision log API, and there are uh, various control planes that you can use to, can, to, to offer policy, to test policy, and to distribute policies in, in large environments. And of course, like Styra is, is, offers one such uh, control plane, and there are other vendors as well. All right, thanks again.